Comics can show and not tell in a way that no other medium can. And it does not mean that they are a better way to tell stories. They are simply a different way to tell stories. This scene told in prose could be just as beautiful, but in a different way. She constantly reminds me that you can love art and science, and when you do both of them together, the world is a better place. We are excited to have her here for our Mass STEM Week lecture to help us share a vision of how there's space for everyone to have a science career. You just need to figure out how to contribute your, your unique talents to it. And with that, Marys Wicks, everyone. I'm Marys Wicks. I'm going to be talking about comics and science and how I use cartoons to communicate complex ideas. And if you're wondering, yes, I did coordinate my outfit to match my presentation. Thank you. It's, it's important. So, <laughs> oh yeah, ah, um, it's the little things. If I'm going to draw cartoons, I might as well make it fun. So. First and foremost, I know Hannah already kind of did the introduction part, but I'm a writer, illustrator, and science communicator. That sounds a little like a confessional, um, but it's true. Um, they're all kind of weird jobs, and I love them. Previous to holding those titles, or at the same time, I have 15 plus years in informal education. So that means museums, eight lovely years at the aquarium, and then I get to do freelance now, which is always fun to come back. Um, camps, after-school programs, uh, volunteering at nursery schools. I really, really, really love out-of-school time education. And it's mostly because that type of education in my younger days had a huge impact on me. And I had classroom teachers that also had a huge impact on me, but I loved getting outside. I loved uh, hands-on experience, and I loved doing anything visual. So when I graduated college, and I, I have a degree, um, Brace yourself, I have a bachelor's of fine art in illustration. Yes, you can get a degree in illustration. Um, I attended a Rhode Island School of Design, or RISD, down in Providence, and when I graduated, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, and I had a lot of ideas. We'll get to a few of them later. Um, but I did know I really wanted to work in education, so I set on that path, and I, I still, what I do now is education, but it's just a little different. It wears a, a different hat. So um, I'm gonna kind of take you through a couple of the projects that I've done. I'm going to be doing readings from each of them. And uh, yeah, so I'll, I'm going to go through these quick and then we'll touch back on them. Um, I've, first book I ever worked on, I illustrated a book called Primates, about primatologists. Um, human body theater. Ooh, yeah, we got primates in the audience. <laughs> I mean, also, yes, we do have primates in the audience. <laughs> but there is actually a physical copy of the book, too. Um, human body theater was my first solo endeavor. Um, coral reefs, uh, cities of the ocean, I started working on after I'd been uh, a program educator at the aquarium for five years. I have a new book coming out in February called Astronauts. Um, and I've done work for the New England Aquarium, not just education work, but lots of freelance illustration. And I really love working with them as an organization. They share my same views. and. Honestly, I could just live in the main building. <laughs> you could just, just, just put me in the basement and I'll come out and just draw all the fish. And actually, you know, honestly, if anybody here knows me, I'm all about the inverts. I love invertebrates. I could just like, just give me a tank of snails, I'd be happy. Um, but in conjunction with the aquarium, I got to develop a uh, climate change choose your own adventure comic called Connect It. And that was in par part funded by uh, NOAA, the National Oceanographic. National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, I've done work for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. Oceanographic is sometimes a difficult word to say. I'll slow down my, my pace, thank you. I got a thumbs up from the back. Um, and I've also, in addition to the, the Woods Hole work, which was NSF, fun, NS, NSF grant funded, National Science Foundation grant funded, um, I did work that brought me to the bottom of the world in Antarctica. So I'm going to be touching on all of these things today, tonight, I guess. You know, it's today somewhere. So before we progress, has anybody here ever read a comic strip? Show of hands. Who's read a comic strip in the newspaper? Okay, cool. Um, who's ever read a comic book? We think of superheroes when we think of comic books. Okay, pretty good. It's not just superheroes, though. Graphic novel. Um, and graphic novels are comic books, but they're usually a contained story that don't come out in issues. Okay, some graphic novel. And any of the things that I'm going to be posting that are not done by me, I try and credit. So if you're curious, there, there are credits up on there for the artist and the title of the work. Um, web comics. Anybody read web comics? Cool. And uh, my, one of my favorites, gag cartoons, just a single panel cartoon. And this is my favorite one. 
because snails, but also, I don't care if she is a tape dispenser, I love her. Um, just like my favorite comic ever. Um, okay, so I pretty much saw almost everybody raise their hand, but I'm gonna ask one more question. Does anybody here ever just doodled aimlessly on a piece of paper for no reason whatsoever? Okay. I think we might have a few robots in the crowd, but that's okay. I, I wanted to get a kind of pulse of where we are with comics because comics we experience pretty much all the time in this country from when you're old enough to look at images. They're, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. But what is comics? Comics, a medium used to express ideas by images often combined with text or other visual information. This doesn't really do it for me, so I'm gonna break it down a little bit. Pictures plus words, sometimes not always, equals information. That is a distilled version of comics, but that is essentially what comics is. So what I'd like to do now is take you on a brief history of the world of comics. These are the Lascaux cave paintings. They're 17,000 years old, and by my definition, those are comics. The tomb of Reckmeyer, 1400 BCE in Egypt. Um, anybody wanna know how to make bread? There you go. Um, there's also the addition of hieroglyphs, so kind of pictures that represent words or objects getting there, so we're getting our words a little bit. Um, travel across the Atlantic Ocean, and the Mayan panel of Tahal Kahan Ak, 8th century CE. Now, my favorite part about this, it's from a longer series, but not only is there pictograms and images, they've contained it in a nice panel, which is what we still use in comics today. Six Horses, Chinese Scroll, 13th to 14th century CE. Um, you have a sequence of images and words telling a story. This is one of my favorite ones because we start to insert the science. These are telephone sketches drawn by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. I love them so much. Drawing and imagery are so completely tied to creativity and innovation and, and invention. Um, and you, 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 you can't deny that. If there's anybody here who is an engineer or a scientist and you work with data or with coming up with solutions to problems, you know we think about those things in a visual manner or we, we often think about them in a visual manner. But one of my favorite parts of this is that Bell has right here used lines to represent an invisible thing, sound. And that is mind blowing that we can take these things, the abstractions, and give them visual representation and that's that's something, we'll come back to that later. We're gonna move into the beginning of the 1900s. This is uh, Little Nemo in Slumberman Slumberland by Windsor McKay. This ran in the newspaper in the early 1900s. The premise for these comics is that Nemo would fall asleep, have a crazy dream, and wake up for everyone. It actually was a pretty sweet premise because you could do whatever you wanted when Nemo was sleeping. And McKay was such an incredible drafts person that his uh, use of drawing perspective and drawing realistically combined with warping that realism, surrealism, made for these incredible, incredibly inventive comics. And if, if anybody's a Windsor McKay nut, he also is kind of like the grandfather of animation and did a lot of really cool stuff with that. So it's worth looking these up. And uh, most reproductions of them have been done actual size. So if you look for them in your library, they're just beautiful to pour over and, and look. And I think they, they're, they're, they're amazing. Fast forward a little bit. I had to do Peanuts just because I feel like this is iconic for me because they were around, but I think these characters still kind of are, are, are recognizable. And I chose this one because there's no words. Um, but what does happen in this comic is, again, surrealism. Sheet music is a two-dimensional thing, and Snoopy is interacting it with it in a three-dimensional way, much to Schroeder's dismay. Um, <laughs> poor Schroeder, I just wanted to play the piano. Um, fast forward a little bit more, 1940s superhero comics, and uh, when I have more time, I do like to read these with voices, but I'll, I'll save the voices for later. This is when we start to think of comics in a sense that we know them now. The panels, the page layout, the yellow caption or narration boxes, word balloons and thought balloons, that kind of language that we generally use today for comics. But this wasn't just happening in the US. Across the globe, comics were becoming really, really popular as a way to tell stories. This is from Astro Boy, drawn by Osamu Tezuka, around the same time as comics were really taking off in the US. Anybody know what's different about this comic in terms of how you read it versus the comic I just showed? Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so depending upon what language you're writing your comics in, if your language reads right to left, your comics will generally read that way. There are exceptions, we can talk about that later if you want to. Um, but in Europe, comics were also taking off. This is from The Adventures of Tintin by Hergé. Um, just, again, similar types of elements you're seeing, word balloons and panels and breakdowns. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a really interesting way to tell stories. Now, comics aren't always a joy. Sometimes they're torture. And by my definition, an IKEA instruction is comics. Whether or not it's effective as a way of communication is up for debate. But I would say that with this definition, comics could possibly save your life or get you out of a pickle. I mean, there's a reason why we use this method to communicate important information. I acknowledge that there are seven different languages on this airline card, but most of the important information is drawn using sequences of pictures with some iconography that we recognize, like the red circle with a line through it is pretty much universally no or don't. Um, this does get a little tricky because there are a lot of cultures across the world, and it is often hard to convey the same information. But we kind of collectively, as a society, for the most part, have these agreed upon kind of warning colors or warning shapes or ways that we, we communicate information. So I'd like to read you an excerpt from a book called Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud. If anybody's interest is piqued in terms of comics through an academic or analytic lens, this is a great book to pick up. So, Scott McCloud says, what is comics? How can we compress the idea down to its essence? Figure A, two black squares. Figure B, two black squares. What if I told you that figure A wasn't comics and that figure B was? Would you believe me? Suppose I told you that figure A was a picture of two squares and figure B was a picture of one square shown at one moment and then the next. Run your finger over A and that finger is moving through space but run it over B, and it's moving through time. To define comics, we needed something like this, and his definition is actually longer than my first one. I, I don't wanna say I spared you, because it is an important definition, because in order to understand things, you do have to define them, but it's long. But to grasp the essence of comics, I think it's helpful to begin to seeing comics as this, an artist's map of time itself. So why comics? And this is where I'm gonna get personal because this question has multiple answers. So the first answer I'm going to demonstrate in reading of a comic. Um, for five years I did uh, one page factual marine biology comics for SpongeBob comics. They did not involve any of the SpongeBob characters. Well, I really wanted to do one about squirrels that had Sandy in it. But the idea is that you could present these real factual comics within it. And this one's about camouflage. So that's what the full page looks like, but I'm gonna take you panel by panel. Hey, how's it going? I'm a flounder. Having a hard time seeing me? That's because I've got some pretty awesome camouflage. With my flat body and sand-colored skin, I have no problem hiding from predators or sneaking up on prey. I get a little jealous of my neighbors, though, like the cuttlefish. Sup, cuttlefish here. I can change the color and texture of my skin. Watch. Here's me in front of some sand. Here's me in front of some seaweed. Here's me in front of some rocks. Some scientists even tried to trick me with a checkerboard. Nice try. It's true. Look up Roger Hanlon's work. He put cuttlefish in front of checkerboards, and they did it. Mm, they're amazing. Some animals just look exactly like their surroundings all the time, like the leafy sea dragon. That's me. I hang out in clusters of seaweed eating tiny shrimp. I love doing the voices, so I'm glad someone else is enjoying it. My fins mimic the shapes of seaweed, making me almost invisible. Om nom 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 nom. Oh! Hey, I'm not actually seaweed. Oops, sorry. She just looked like a really tasty salad. Hmm. So, uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing something kind of weird here. I'm presenting you with factual information, but I'm doing it in a fictional way. So I'm walking this tightrope where I'm bending the rules of nonfiction by giving a voice to things that don't have voices, or by kind of giving a story to this information. And I think that's the biggest 
part of why I do what I do because I don't honestly care that those are three different methods of camouflage and sometimes I can't even remember the name for them whether it's situational or environmental or um, physiological and I, that can come later. The important part is, is why. Why is it there? What's the story? And I think that's kind of the fundamental answer for me. Now there's, I told you there are multiple answers to why comics. I want to read to you an excerpt from Primates. This is, uh, its subtitle is The Fearless Science of Jane Goodall, who studies chimpanzees. Boop. Diane Fossey, who studied mountain gorillas. Boop. I love sound effects. Um, and Berate Gaudacas, who studies orangutans. So <clears throat> we're going to jump into the middle of this book. We're in the jungles of Rwanda, and we're with Diane Fossey, and she is on her very first um, Safari. She's always wanted to see gorillas, and this is her first time go going on that adventure. An overwhelmingly musky, barnyard yet human like stench. Ah, 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 But the sound, really something. Nothing can possibly prepare you for such an avalanche. I'm not going to scream, but just imagine me going, ay, ay. A beat. Those little yellow squiggles are stink lines. That's what we like to call them in the business. Ah, 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 ah. More yelling. <laughs> and now you are Diane Fossey, seeing mountain gorillas for the very first time. Comics can show and not tell in a way that no other medium can. And it does not mean that they are a better way to tell stories. They are simply a different way to tell stories. This scene told in prose could be just as beautiful, but in a different way. So there's this, and this is why it almost feels wrong to read comics on a lecture, because there's this intimacy that you have with the book when you're reading it yourself and pacing and things. But at the same time, I love reading comics to an audience full of people because it's, it's, it's a fun way to share them. So I draw an incredibly cartoony manner, but that's not to say that this book was hundreds of reference photos and I read as much as I possibly could, whether it was the journals of Goodall and watched biographies and documentaries, I did my homework. But in distilling the story or abstracting a little bit, my goal is to kind of make it more accessible. Because often the more real we try to get, our brains pick up and go, it's weird, it's not actually real, but it's trying to be. There's this, Accessibility that simplification can give us, and, and especially when reading a story about a person. Um, and I feel like that's part of the reason why I gravitate towards that style. I want to break down a little bit just how a page of comics become a comic, um, or a finished, a finished comic, just because I think it's worth mentioning that um, this book took me four years to draw, and I didn't even write it. It was written by Jim Ottaviani. I got the script, and then I adapted it based on the script. So. Um, this is just that one page that you had seen previously, the gorillas. The script is that. It's weird to think that that becomes uh, that finished drawing, but you have to start somewhere, and comic scripts are incredibly important, especially to the artist. Um, from there, thumbnails. This drawing itself is two inches by three inches. Thumbnails are called thumbnails for a reason. But before I do any parts other than the beginning, um, I have to sketch out the whole book. You basically are doing the whole book all at, all at once so you can see how the pages flow and how everything looks. And seeing a whole book like on a wall is, is, is important. There's stuff that you might miss, even though you're experiencing it page by page when you read it. After thumbnails is pencils, and then inks and colors. Up into the coloring part, I'm working with live medium, a media, so either pencils or inks. And the colors are done digitally in Photoshop. Um, mostly because it's easier to make them for print. Uh, I love to paint, but realistically, if you're making work for print, it's a lot easier to just do your colors digitally. That's for me. Other artists have different ways that they like to do things, and there's nothing wrong with that. Just for me personally, it's easier for me to manage the colors that way. So, Human Body Theater, my book baby. I say that because I both wrote and illustrated it, which was terrifying, because when I was a junior in high school, I got a D in English, which was not good. My mom was very upset. Um, <laughs> I talked a little bit about how I'm a hands-on learner and a visual learner. Turns out, middle school and high school were really difficult for me. Um, 
elementary school transition to lots of textbooks, lots of testing, not a lot of hands-on stuff. The two places where I could do the most hands-on stuff in classes were science and art. So I tried to take as many of those as I could, but I still lagged behind. And it wasn't until I figured out that I have to ask for help from a lot of my teachers, which I'm really stubborn, and that was really hard to do for like 14, 15 year old Maris. I was also really into punk and had pink hair, and I was just like, I don't wanna ask for help, but I did. And it turned out it helped because I, I was going through most of my middle school and high school years thinking I was dumb. That I, I that it was my fault that I didn't understand it. And really what it was is that I was a different, not different, but I, I learned in a different way and I didn't understand how I learned things best. And by asking for help, I understood that better. And I wish I had had someone when I was younger say, what, what are the ways you like to learn? What, how do you learn best? And I've talked to lots of teachers now and I know those conversations are being have, had with students at a lot younger. And thank you, thank you so much if you're a teacher, a librarian, or parent out there that's having that conversation. Because the earlier that I could understand how to learn, it just made my life easier. So the reason why this book happened is because I was desperate to make more comics. And I said, Jim, who wrote, wrote Primates, I go, Jim, I want to do another book together. And he goes, I think you should write your own book. And I had looked up to him as a writer for so long. And I go, OK. <laughs> um, remember how I told you I didn't know what I wanted to do in college? Well, turns out senior year, I took a class at my local fire station and got certified to be an emergency medical technician in Massachusetts. And I, I know it sounds kind of crazy, um, but I did. And then I observed as an apprentice with a company in Cambridge um, for a couple of shifts. And I quickly realized that I was not cut out for that job. It's terrifying. If there's anybody here who is an emergency uh, medical personnel or firefighter, just mad props because it is, it's, it's very difficult. And I have a lot of respect for people who do that job. I don't mind that I, I, I at the time I felt I was a failure because I couldn't, but I don't mind that I did it because it gave me a whole lot of information about the human body. So this book came very natural to me, not just because I have a human body, but because I enjoy learning about them. It's told from the perspective of the skeleton right here. And the skeleton uh, covers each major system and it's kind of like a video game where it's like the boss is the body system. And every time the, human, the skeleton covers a system, they like level up and get that system. And by the end, they're a fully formed human being. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you this section because that, that cell diagram on the left-hand side, it's hard to do the reverse, um, is something that we're kind of used to seeing in biology textbooks. And I saw that and I'm like, oh, it's pretty, but you know what? I need more. I need a cast of characters. So the cytoplasm is the jelly-like substance inside the cell. And um, oh, um, the nucleus contains the genetic instructions. That's the DNA for the cell. And the mitochondria provide energy for the cell. The endoplasmic reticulum subjectively the best word in all of human biology, um, makes the proteins, like enzy enzymes. Golgi bodies package the proteins into vesicles. And vesicles leave the cell carrying substances produced by the cell. See you later. I can't not think this way. I think like cartoons. And <laughs> I know I'm not the only one who sees the world this way. And it's been like that since I was a kid. There's a reason why I loved animation and loved cartoons and comics. It's how my brain absorbs stuff. And the way I took notes in school, I would draw these little characters. So you don't have to be an artist to like experiencing the world that way, but it just makes it easier for me. So I figured if it's easy for me, it's probably easier for someone else to see them. Um, my writing process is kind of a little all over the place. Because I'm a visual person and I like hands-on stuff, I tend to write a lot on paper. It just feels good to me and I can circle things and do doodles in the margins. Um, although I did just work, write my first script on a computer. It might have been a bad idea because it was like 400 pages long, but we'll get to that later. Um, problem for my editor. Uh, <clears throat> so this little highlighted part is going to become a page of comics. So it goes from that to, a, it was the outline, goes to a script, um, do a bunch of research. This section is about viruses from the Im immune system chapter. My thumbnail, my little two by three inch drawing, and I've done the whole, like do the whole book this way. I'm only showing you one page. Pencils, inks, and colors. Each one of these stages that I'm showing you, it's, I'm not creating these in a vacuum. I do have an editor and I have people who are giving me feedback. It's similar to like doing a book report where every stage you kind of submit it for approval and it's really important to have someone else saying, hey, 
this isn't clear, this part needs to be moved around because you can be so in it that you might lose sight of, of is it actually making sense or is it telling the information in the clearest way possible. Um, so it just, just made sense to make a book that way. Now, this, is, this book's near and dear to my heart for multiple reasons. Um, but after Human Body Theater, I really wanted to do an ocean book and I didn't know what I wanted to do. And my, my publisher goes, well, we really want to do one about coral reefs. And I was like, awesome, coral reefs are great. I had only seen coral reefs the way that pretty much everybody sees coral reefs, either in books or on documentaries, or you know, if you're lucky in an aquarium, there's like a tank with coral. I've never actually seen like a, a, a real reef before. And I know I didn't get to go inside the human body for human body theater. And I know that I didn't get to travel to Africa or Indonesia for primates, but I said, you know what? What if I got scuba certified for this book? <laughs> and it was a little treat to myself, but I also was thinking of ways that I could experience something that could help give the book more dimensions, give it, give it something that it, that it needed. And part of it's selfish. I mean, like I spend hours alone by myself in front of a computer for my job. I feel like it's okay if I go to the Caribbean. Um, so my, for my 33rd birthday, I got scuba certified. I um, can't remember what orientation we are in this building, but I got my, I got, did my checkout dives like in the harbor, um, right by Little Brewster Island. So it was great. My first animals I saw were a lobster and a tuna kit. And I was like, whoa, yeah, tuna kits. Um, they're great, tuna kits, they're just, they're awesome. Anyways, um, and I decided that the best way to see a reef was to join members of the aquarium along with the general public on a collecting trip on, on board um, the RV Coral Reef 2, which is owned and operated by the Shedd Aquarium. And I spent 10 days living on this boat um, just diving my butt off, um, which was awesome, and seeing reefs. But not just seeing reefs. I was seeing organisms interacting with each other. I was seeing what the reef looked like during the day versus during the night. I was seeing damage that had been done to the reefs from all sorts of stuff. And it just, it, it gave me perspective on the book that I was making. Um, even just the way light moves through the water. And there is a number of fantastic photographers on the trip and they were nice enough to share some of their images with me and that helped a lot when I was coloring coral reefs. So, Full disclosure, Coral Reefs, the book, is about a lot more than just coral reefs. It's about global ocean health. It's about um, ways that we can kind of help make our planet a better place. So I'm gonna read you kind of two sections, and one of them is one of my favorite, um, how we're connected to the ocean, even if you live 2,000 miles away. Take a deep breath. Now take nine more. You're going to keep breathing because that's just what we do. It's an involuntary thing, but you know, sometimes I like to tell people to breathe because that's nice. Those 10 breaths you just took, oh, sorry for the typo. Now you know it's there. Seven of them were all thanks to the ocean. Whoa. Photosynthesis is the process used by plants to take in carbon dioxide and convert it into oxygen. Um, I used to sing this one way, and then I had a teacher tell me that she sings it to the tune of sitting on the dock of the bay, so that's why I'm gonna sing it for you now. Eating up the CO2. And I'm farting out the oxygen. There we go. I told you there was going to be singing. If anybody follows me on Twitter, I'm like, I will sing. Um, if you get this question on a test, don't put eating up the CO2 and farting out the oxygen and be like, Marius told me that's what photosynthesis is. But hopefully this will jog your brain if you're confronted with the uh, confusion of photosynthesis. For a long time, humans assumed that trees and plants are responsible for the world's oxygen production. Trees do help, but they only supply the earth with about 30 to 40% of its oxygen. No offense, trees. None taken. After all, we only cover about 8% of the Earth's surface. This is when you realize I only have like three voices <laughs> for the characters. <laughs> and the book is narrated by a yellow prawn goby. That wears glasses, of course. To find our main producers of oxygen, grab your microscope and head out into the ocean. Just because you're tiny, does not mean you're not important. Isn't that right, little dudes? And there is a microscope slide of tiny farting phytoplankton. Also fond of alliteration. Algae and phytoplankton, an umbrella term for all plant-like plankton, are contributing to the other 60 to 70% of the world's oxygen. So this idea that we live in our own habitats and environments and they're part of larger ones, but also just thinking of our planet as a place that we live and kind of global habitat, global climate, global health, um, was something I really wanted to 
to do in that book to make those connections. Um, the book talks a lot about climate change and pollution, and those are all things that are scary. They were scary when I was a kid, and they're scary now. And just like what Hannah said, having the conversation or providing space to have the conversation is really important. But I didn't just want to give you information. I also really wanted to talk about taking action and what are things we can do. And there are little things and big things and all sorts of things. So in my mind, I was thinking about who's going to be reading this book the most, and I was thinking, probably people who can't vote yet. Not always, but like I know a lot of a lot of younger people are going to be reading this book. So the take action part kind of has three three steps for this. And I, I talk about a problem and then talk about solutions. So vehicles that run on uh, sorry run on gas release carbon dioxide or CO2 into the atmosphere. Walking, biking, or carpooling can help reduce the amount of carbon. Or even better, organize a carpool group to school or sports practice. Woohoo! Plastics are made from oil. More oil means more CO2 in the atmosphere. Use, uh, use a reusable water bottle, lunchbox, or snack bag to reduce the amount of plastic in your life. Even better, get your school or house to be zero waste starting by starting a recycling and composting plan. Get outside. Having fun outdoors helps us appreciate our awesome planet. Plant a tree, participate in a trail or beach cleanup, or organize your own event for your friends and family. Another woohoo. And those are just a few of the things you can do to help your habitat and mine. So kind of thinking about this, this it's, it, we're all sharing the same habitat if you think about Earth. Um, the other thing that the fish does, but I didn't include it because it's long, is that the fish actually does write a letter <laughs> to their representative. <laughs> and it's just, I think it just says like, please save reefs that Kay thanks by. And I was like, it's pretty good for a fish. <laughs> Um, but again, kind of coupling this humor, but still um, really thinking about presenting information, but also solutions. Well, turns out if you go on one adventure, you might become addicted to going on other adventures. So this is the RV Atlantis. Um, it's a Navy owned boat, but it's operated by Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. You might be familiar with this boat because, I'm sorry, Ship, thank you. <laughs> I was like, oh, I said boat, someone's gonna, and thank you. So, yeah, I'm glad that we were on that, like, same way. <laughs> like, it's a ship. I, yeah. Also, don't whistle on them. Seriously, I got yelled at for whistling in the stairwell on the ship because I was whistling up the wind. We were in port. <sighs> Anyways, you might recognize the ship because it is the ship that deploys deep submergence vehicle Alvin. <laughs> Sorry, I really like doing the like late night home shopping network version of that voice. And also AUV, autonomous underwater vehicle, Sentry. Um, I like to put faces on things that don't have faces, if you can't tell. But uh, what I'm going to read you from is the blog for this trip. Uh, Woods Hole hired me to be the science communicator for a research cruise that was going into the middle of the ocean um, for about 40 days. And I was told that it's like prison, but if you try and escape, you might drown. Now that's that's not actually that's not actually true. Um, but there is something to be said that uh, working remotely or working in the field is a huge commitment. You have to be okay with being on a ship with 60 people in the middle of the ocean for 40 days. Now I worked at summer camp, so I was pretty much all set. Like I worked at summer camp for like. 15 years, um, and all different flavors. I worked at the aquariums camp, I worked at a wilderness camp, I worked at like a wacky arts camp. Um, so yeah, I was, I was good to go. Turns out summer camp prepares you for like a lot of stuff. <laughs> so, popping rocks, deep questions on the mid-Atlantic ridge. Oh, this was a geology cruise, and I'm not sure if you picked up on this, but I tend to lean pretty bio in my interests, but I was like, you know what? <laughs> rocks, I got this. Um, geologists are absolutely lovely, and I, part of, part of this trip was, for the first time, I was going to be working directly with scientists and collaborating. So this, this was like the fun shared knowledge stuff. Um, I love rocks now, they're so cool. In 1985, a geologic expedition aboard the, R, oh, sorry, aboard the Soviet research vessel RV Academic Boris Petrov made a surprising find near the Mid-Atlantic Ridge at 14 degrees north. That is Russian for rocks. I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry. If there's anybody in here who speaks Russian, feel free to, thank you. Um, volcanic rocks that popped when they were brought on deck. 
This was a result of volatiles in the rocks escaping under the pressure difference between the seafloor and the sea surface. A French graduate student named Philippe Sarda took some of the rocks back to Paris. I'm going to butcher this, but I'm going to try because I know, I know more French than I know Russian. Voici les roches qui disent pop. Here are the rocks that say pop. <laughs> and found not only that the popping rocks contained a high percentage of carbon dioxide gas, in fact, they were among the most carbon dioxide rich samples ever studied, but that they also contain nearly pristine samples of noble gases from deep beneath the surface of the Earth. Ladies and gentlemen, the helium three. Ooh, it's not a car. Those rocks are basaltic lava that cooled under pressure and from over 1200 degrees Celsius to near freezing within seconds of erupting onto the seafloor. Bloop, Ugh, it's cold out here. They have a glassy outer layer that traps gases that would otherwise escape into the water or atmosphere. Those gases provide an unparalleled view into the composition and conditions of the Earth that could help answer some of the biggest questions about our planet's history and formation. How did the atmosphere and oceans form? Where did I come from? Yes, the ocean is perpetually having an existential crisis. And how does the global carbon cycle work? Unfortunately, the precise location where the scientists on board the academic Boris Petrov made their discovery is lost to pre-GPS history. We do know that they come from a complex region of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge that contains vast areas of lava flows as well as heavily faulted terrain with uh, intact blocks of deep crust. The popping rocks come from the boundary between these two very different types of geology. The goal for our NSF, National Science Foundation, funded mission is to take the towed instrument platform TOCAM, the autonomous underwater vehicle sentry, beep boop, and the human-occupied submersible Alvin. Ooh, rocks! I, Alvin is perpetually enthusiastic about everything. If I, like, I, I think about Alvin as a character. On board the modern research vessel Atlantis back at 14 degrees north to find lava flows that contain popping rocks. In addition, we'll map the volcanic and structural features of the Rift Valley, where they are located to better understand the geological history of this portion of the global mid-ocean ridge. Beep boop. We'll use TOCAM to scout for promising geologic settings. Whee! Then launch the programmable autonomous sentry to make high-resolution maps of the seafloor. Woohoo! Beep boop. <laughs> to help pinpoint locations for Alvin to dive and retrieve new samples of popping rocks. Hooray! If we're successful, we'll return home with new samples that provide clues to help answer some very deep questions about the nature of our planet. Pop. So this was the intro one. We did find popping rocks. <laughs> this is the mascot we had, but um, we had really successful um, collections with Alvin, and it was fantastic. Um, the trip got cut a little short, so they actually had a part two that I was unable to go out on. But if you're interested in reading more of the comics, the, I think it's poppingrocks.hui.edu or org. If you Google popping rocks, and if you're like me, when you start to type it, you accidentally type pooping rocks, which is just a problem I have. Um, if you look up popping, popping rocks in Woods Hole, it will, too much information. It will, it will bring you to the, to the blog. So, <clears throat> Well, I figured if I was going to be out in the middle of the ocean, why not go somewhere more exotic, like Antarctica? <laughs> I had done mostly tropical uh, endeavors, but this was kind of a, a, new, a, new, a new cold front, if you will. Um, the National Science Foundation has a grant called the Antarctic Artists and Writers Grant, and the purpose of that grant is to send artists and writers to Antarctica and document in the way that they see fit science that's happening in Antarctica. Um, it's, a, it's an actual National Science Foundation grant. The grant application process is very similar to applying for a science grant. Um, it's long <laughs> and takes a lot of research, um, but I applied and I got it. And uh, things aren't actually upside down there. They're, they are right side up. But I had the incredible privilege of living at McMurdo Station, which is the largest station on the continent. It's, a, it's an American station for two and a half months. And I shadowed 15 different scientific research teams. And I know most of the time people think about seals because they're awesome. Let's be real, charismatic megafauna are pretty cool. I, now that I've said that and the seals heard, let's talk about how cool inverts are because like really it's all about the giant sea spiders and I didn't want the sea lions and harbor seals to hear. So anyways, um, but 
There are astrophysicists there doing research on cosmic rays and neutrinos. There are geologists and volcanologists there because turns out McMurdo Station's like 13 miles from the world's southernmost active volcano, Mount Erebus. I stared into a volcano. It said bloop back to me. Um, it was the, most, the biggest honor that I could be given. Um, but just there's atmospheric science, climate science, um, just ice. I mean, there's a whole lot of ice down there, like just ice for days. Um, so glaciologists, and it's, it's incredible. Um, and I acknowledge that it is a place that so few people get to go. So my, my goal was to go and to just try and get as much as I can of the place. Now, only 10% of the folks at McMurdo Station are research scientists. The other 90% are support staff. They're the people that make it tick. So in a sense, my research was not just scientific, it was about life in Antarctica because those people are there because of the science, but the science can't exist without them. So I could go out, I could draw seals. This was actually one of the coldest days um, of my being down there. It doesn't look like it, it looks really nice, but I filled over four different notebooks of drawings of seals, sounds of seals, smells of seals. You can't smell that much when you're cold, but actually, you know what? We want to talk about smells, penguins. Um, it's cold, and you've got your snow pants, and you're like been kneeling in penguin poop for a long time, but then <laughs> you can't tell, and then it starts to warm up when you're in your tent. You're like, oh, I forgot. I was kneeling in penguin poop all day. So it's kind of an honorable, gross thing. Um, but from there, I could work to, oh, sorry. I had to draw this because while I love the seals, I was incredibly envious of their protections. Um, there, was, there was a lot of blubber. I, at one point, really wished that I was better prepared. Um, no amount of Nutella could prepare me for Antarctica. Um, but yeah, no, they, they're, it's incredible that there are living organisms down there that are also mammals that live there all year round. Because I was there in the summer, and it's, yeah. Um, working directly with scientific research teams could allow me to talk about how they might want to see their data visualized. There was actually a group out of um, Mass General Hospital that was looking at what happens in Weddell seals on a cellular level when they dive, because it's basically a low oxygen event. They'll be diving for an hour. How does their body physically do it? Because we sure can't. Um, and they're actually looking at that in those animals to see if there are ways that their physiological adaptations could help humans that have been through low oxygen events, like a stroke or a heart attack. So just kind of like fascinating ways that we're connected to seals in Antarctica and we don't even know it. Um, this is McMurdo Station, and I'm showing you just process stuff because the book is in process, but I figured it'd be worth talking a little bit about what it looks like to actually do the work behind a finished, pro finished project. Um, and this is what my desk looks like when I'm writing. I, this is the one that I wrote on a computer. <laughs> um, 412 pages, actually. I rounded down because it sounds less terrifying if you take away those 12. Um, but yeah, it's just it's it's a lot of uh, stuff you don't see, and we are we are often a culture of things, people that don't focus on process, it's a lot of product. So I try and be very transparent about how long it takes or how much work goes into these things that you might just say, oh, it's just a cartoon of a seal. I was like, no, I actually was pretty cold when I was researching that seal. So I wanna end on kind of a finished project. Uh, Jim Ottaviani, who wrote the Primates book, and I were able to collaborate again on a book called Astronauts, Women on the Final Frontier. It's, it's kind of a companion to Primates in a sense that it's talking about um, kind of just like history and science and how we've gotten to be where we are. So I'm gonna read you just a few excerpts from the book. The main character who is right here is actually astronaut Mary Cleave. She was the second, does anybody actually know who she is? Yeah, so this is why the book is about her. Um, no, and, and, and that's, that's actually seriously why we wanted to make this book. Um, the first class of shuttle astronauts had Sally Ride, the first American woman in space. And a lot of times when you're the first, it's really important because it's monumental, it's, it's, it's historical. But many times the people who come after you, their work isn't as elevated or, or paid attention to. So I think it's really important that, yes, to acknowledge these important moments in history, but to keep seeking out the people who are doing the work. So we're gonna start with the beginning. This is what a famous astronaut looks like. <laughs> Gloves, Nomex and silicone. Helmet, polycarbonate faceplate, mechanical seal, sunshade. Uh, seal like a, not like a er, er. <laughs> Communication, often called a snooky, snoopy cap. 
Survival backpack, parachute, life raft, survival gear, 30 minute supply of oxygen, paratrooper boots, launch and reentry pressure suit, LES. NASA is very fond of acronyms, as is Antarctica actually. Long johns, cotton. So is this, astronaut, famous. Maybe not so famous. So we already poke fun of this in the beginning. This is Mary. Mary's on the beginning of her first flight. Now it's not just her story. She is kind of a conduit to go back in time 20 years before she was in the astronaut program to look at the history of not just women in the space program, but introducing inclusion and diversity in the space program. And really what, what made it happen was the Equal Opportunity Employment Act in the late 70s. And that's what kick-started um, making sure that everybody has not the opportunity, but the ability to shoot for the opportunity, to dream, and to try and fulfill those dreams as best they can. Um, and I think it's really important to tell these stories because it's really easy to look at what we have now and where we've come. But if you don't look at what's happened before, you're missing a pretty big part of the picture. I learned stuff working on this book that I didn't know, stories that I felt like were stories I should have known growing up. Um, so I don't want to... I don't want to give away too much of the book, but it's it was incredibly fun for me to work on and also illuminating. We're going to jump into later. Mary's the first day into her space flight. I was a flight engineer on STS-61B. About 1986 um, was that launch for the shuttle. I had to be able to find our navigation stars in case we needed backup for the star tracker device. So you got to adapt your eyes to the dark. You have a bag that you put around the window, and then you look out, and you find your nav stars. You know? before you really need them. So my first day up in orbit, I go into the little bag and hang out, and I look out. Uh-oh. I mean, you have never seen the stars. Even if you've been out in a dark sky, you've never seen the stars without an atmosphere in the way, messing with your view. I mean, air is not overrated, but it's, it's, it's breathtaking. And then I think, oh, sugar. I'm never gonna find the nav stars. I'm used to seeing just a constellation or two, and now, okay, this is what we do before we have a nav computer fail. Deep breath. The colors, they're... So you're seeing what Mary's seeing. And why I love the scene is because she's already in space and she's having a wow moment. There is nothing in this world that can prevent us from keeping having wow moments, even if you're an astronaut in space. And I think the biggest takeaway from, I think from this book and anything, is to give yourself access to those wow moments. Allow yourself to be put in experiences or situations that give them that. For me, a lot of my first wow moments were actually at the aquarium, whether it was at a young, as a young person or when I would take the train up from college and go draw there. I just loved the feeling of being like, oh my gosh, did you see that fish? That fish just like tried to bite that other fish. <laughs> or it was just like Myrtle getting fed. I'm like, did you see her eat those Brussels sprouts? Oh my goodness. Um, but sorry, it's still like that now after all these years. I, I really do feel like I want as many people as possible in the world to have these moments. So I'm very passionate about, a lot of times when I go to book events or go to comic shows and I don't do it as much anymore, I'll bring a microscope and people are like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, don't you wanna look at stuff under a microscope? It's awesome. Um, I also have a telescope and uh, one of my favorite things to do is to take it out on the sidewalk and just see if people wanna see the moon because it's, it's incredible. I mean, like Mary, you've never seen the moon. And it's just with a telescope on the sidewalk in Arlington. So I think it's really important to allow or make space for people to have those moments. And I think places like the aquarium or museums or schools do, do allow that to happen. And I think those are awesome resources. I just want as many people as possible to look through a telescope. So why science? And I know it's kind of obvious because we're all here, we're in the aquarium lecture hall. And, um, again, this one's a little personal for me. Um, I've kind of given you the specifics of each of the projects we've talked about, but why science? Because it's observation and conservation. It's public health and medicine. It's you know learning about your environment and those connections. It's exploration and discovery. I mean, just seeking knowledge and information and, and new things. It's global connections and freezing your butt off. <laughs> and it's inspiration. So for me, science is everything. And I, I, that's just 
the way it feels for me. So it, I, it, I, I don't have to answer these questions, but it does feel good to, to say that. So thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. And I will stop talking now. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna paraphrase your question if you don't mind. So someone who does science outreach is wondering about how much do you simplify? How much do you sacrifice, sacrifice of actual information so that you're still giving someone correct information but, but in a simplified way? And this is, is it that, that, that do an okay job of it? Um, this is something I have to deal with all the time in the work that I do because honestly, the way that we learn science is always going to be a little cut off from the actual kernel of truth. And my favorite example is, I love snails. Those little things on the top of the snail's body, what do you call them? Antenna, antennae. Well, you know what? They're technically tentacles. <laughs> but like, I think you have to be really careful with policing language in science, especially in young people. Because if you go around correcting everybody and kind of holding up, like, no, 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 it's not that way. It, there's, a, there's a delicacy kind of that you dance around with. So I'm a big fan of two things. Knowledge building, so kind of constructive knowledge building where you're, you're starting with a solid base and you're adding these things on top of it. And that's one of the things I thought about for human body theater. I go, I can start with these basic terms and build upon them so that it's not just coming out of left field for your reader when you introduce something. They've already had like kind of a foreshadowing to it. And then the other part is choosing when to deliberately introduce a new term because there's a, there's a joy in learning a new word. And I love that for science. Science is full of fantastic words. You saw how much I nerded out about endoplasmic reticulum, right? Um, same thing with zooxanthellae. When I worked at the aquarium, I loved to get preschoolers to scream zooxanthellae. And it wasn't just to hear them scream it. Um, I really wanted them to understand that corals have a best friend that live on them, and that best friend is kind of like a plant, an algae, and that plant's name is zooxanthellae, and corals and zooxanthellae are buddies. So that, that is kind of up to the person, but it does, when you simplify, I find that, like anything, I do a lot more work than is visible. I cast a wide net, and from there, that's a Sorry, pun intended, um, <laughs> aquarium joke. Um, but from there, I can kind of sort out all of the, I don't wanna talk about bycatch, but I, I, I sort out kind of like, what are the fundamentals and then what can I add on to them? So a lot of the, a lot of the work that I do when I'm in the beginning phases of making a book is kind of distilling it down to the key parts and then making those charts that have like the spider legs that branch off. Does anybody, does anybody know what those are called where you're like, fruits and it's like banana apple and like word, web. word web thank you <laughs> i knew there had to be a name for it this is a visual thing um so yeah it's really difficult and i i've had i try and have when i do work with scientists to keep that transparency there and to say hey what is a good way to simplify this because i know that this is information we have to pare down and you might have noticed with the popping rocks comic that's actually really dense like the language in that comic is adult or high school. Um, and that was something we, we talked about, like we're gonna make this language so that it is dense, but it's coupled with pictures that will hopefully reinforce kind of the main kernels. When I was in Antarctica, did I get to see under the nice ice? Not in person. Um, I did befriend a number of research teams and divers that showed me fantastic footage. I did not have enough time to fulfill, well, sorry, I didn't have enough time and money and even desire to fulfill the requirements I had to be an ice diver down there. It just was not realistic because in order to dive there, you have to have a, a pretty extensive background of certification and also dive times and, and logged dives. So I did the next best thing, which was just um, sharing pictures from people and talking to them as much as possible. And that is a pretty sensational space that lots of photographers have taken pictures of. So it's, a, it's an, an area for me when I'm looking for images for reference, it actually wasn't too hard to find. There is a wet lab in the lab building at McMurdo, which basically means a lab with a whole bunch of tanks, and they had an invert tank. So I did get to see like sea spiders in real life and like, you know how roly polies, the little pill bugs, have like giant deep sea cousins? I got to see some of those. Um, so I did get to interact with some of the organisms, but unfortunately I didn't, I didn't get to actually dive there. Okay, so my, uh, the question is my background, my academic background is in art, but I had to lean towards science. And the question is, for someone who has an academic background in science, what are some resources or ways that they can start to pursue art? It's 
hard. Um, the education that I got for art was four really intense years of drawing constantly. So a lot of, so first start off by saying drawing is an absolute learned skill. You can be a little bit okay at it, but anybody who's an artist, you are spending so much time. So the best thing that I can say is if you're interested in pursuing art, um, practice. Keep a sketchbook, keep a journal. Um, or if you are already, or you do, if you're doing active science in a research sense, start figuring out ways that you might integrate art. For me, it's really comfortable for me to make non-living things talk and give them faces, because that's just what I like to do. But it doesn't have to be the way I do it. Um, and the other thing, what I, the other thing I'd say is to look at what's out there, see what people are doing. Um, the work that I do doesn't exist in a vacuum. I'm inspired by so many previous people who've come before me, but I'm also inspired by people who are working now. And it doesn't have to be within science. You can just be like, oh, I like their art. Why do I like their art? Because that's a really important question to ask yourself when you find yourself liking an image or liking something. Why did you like it? Why did you like that movie? And if you start to, con if you begin to verbalize why you like something, that's kind of the road to art literacy and really examining like, well, okay, why did I like it? I liked it for these reasons. If I were to make something, why would I do it? How would I do it? And that kind of begets that. Um, if you're interested in comics specifically, there are some local resources. Um, unfortunately, it happened last weekend, but the Mass Independent Comics Expo, MICE, is fantastic. Um, I, I, know, I know some of you were there um, because I saw some comics folks. They offer free workshops that you can go in and take. So look, look in your neighborhood, see if there's classes that kind of do art with a science skew. Um, for me, I like having a reason to go draw so if there's like, oh, I signed up for this class, I have to do it. Sometimes it takes away the part of my brain that was like, oh, maybe you shouldn't do it. You should put it off some more. You should do some more research or you don't have time for it. So sometimes making concrete things that you have to do. Um, and just even the online community, there's drawing prompts sometimes that are shared. So right now it's Inktober, um, which isn't science related, but it's basically just do an ink drawing a day for Oct Inktober. For October. Um, my personal favorite is Mermaid, where you get to draw a mermaid every day for May. Um, I, if anybody knows my art, you can look up my mermaids. It's mostly just shark up talk and human legs down the bottom. I like reverse mermaids, so. Um, but, but think about the pleasure, like drawing for me is a pleasure, I love it. It is my job and sometimes I have hard days, but think about what you like. Because if you are going to be making art, you should have a reason. And the reason can just be because I want to. Um, and the reason can be even longer to because like, I think it's a really good way to communicate the science that I do, or I think it's a really fun way to interact with other people who do the same thing. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's tricky. And feel free to, we can talk more about that afterwards as well. Um, do I have time for one more question? Tools or apps um, that I would recommend. Do you mean for making art or for getting it out there? For making art. So I'm, I've been, right now all I use is Photoshop to color things. Uh, there have been significant advancements in digital drawing applications and tools. I tend to still draw on paper and take pictures of it with my phone and post it on the internet. Um, a lot of the tools are expensive. And part of the reason why I still work the way I do is because like, I expect to have my laptop for six or seven years. So buying a new iPad means not only learning how to use the new programs, but also um, a significant investment. So I usually say if there are apps that are similar to ones that are paid, test them out first. I know that there are some comparable things to Photoshop um, and they might be worth playing around with. If you do have an iPad, I know I think Procreate's a free app for drawing. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mostly, <laughs> I've been like, it's been I think 15 years that I've been kind of working the same way that I work. So I have to admit that I'm not completely up to tempo on what's the best thing to use. I, I do, I'm trying to think, pretty much the only thing that I think about is the way that I share art, and a lot of that time that's through Twitter and Instagram. So I'm sorry if I can't completely speak to that question, but we can, if you want to pick my brain about specifics about that afterwards as well, that'd be fine. Isn't she just amazing?